Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to see you, those who were last week and those who joined us only today in our second lecture on the music collection and issues and subjects about Jewish and Israeli music. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. Asaf Shelek, who was for many, 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 many days a visitor in our collection uh, from nine to five, we can say daily. And he's the one who opens the scores and letters and uh, other relevant material of uh, the many archival material we have of birth of uh, composers. And uh, out of this uh, reading, he all he also published already two books, and I'm sure more are coming. Um, he's also a professor uh, of musicology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Prior to that, he taught at the University of Virginia and at Washington University in St. Louis. But we are very happy that he joined the staff of the Hebrew University and he is in Jerusalem. Uh, his first book, uh, Jewish Contigu Contiguities and the Soundtrack of Israeli History was published by Oxford University Press in 2014. And his new book just arrived and uh, not too many people, including me, had already read it, but I'm sure it's very intriguing because it's called Theological Stains, Art, Music and the Zionist Project and was just published, as I said, two months ago. So uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you Asaf, and also I'm happy to hear what he has to say about his discoveries in the archives that I sit in every day. So Asaf, Bevakasha. Thank you, Gila. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'll begin by telling you a very short story about my work at, at the um, National uh, Jewish Library and the way I got to write history from and through through the archive. And uh, you know, doing that from the archive is a bit difficult today since everything is remote. But uh, through the archive means that we never limit ourselves to just one collection, just manuscript, just letters, just diaries, just anthologies of Jewish music, just recordings or field recordings of, of different uh, oral Jewish musical traditions. It's all a very thick and fuzzy network that you get to um, um, discover and, and get some, some paths revealed and, 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 um, and uh, syncopate somehow with other parallel things that are going on at the same time that uh, is, is part of what, of what uh, I mean by, by through, because there are so many different materials at the, at the archive that one cannot limit himself to just one thing, just analysis or just music history or just social history. And the more you work um, at the library, you discover that many uh, of the uh, assumptions you, you came with, you, had, you have to check them at the door if you want to really do research in a way that would allow you to uh, free yourself and hopefully your future readers from uh, getting locked in those uh, predispositions. Um, so when I started my, my research as a PhD student, that was 740 years ago, uh, when I started my, my, uh, my research there, um, I was working on um, modern music in the early 20th century, and I wanted to look not just not just at Jews or uh, on Jewish music or music written by Jews. I knew that the the, uh, the method would have to be much more sophisticated, much more noisy. Uh, so I was looking at certain habitats, where uh, be there, uh, be that in Berlin or in. Florence or in Munich or in Paris. I wanted to look at those habitats to see what is the meaning of, of uh, modern music there? What is the cultural discourse and what Jews are doing there either as composers or as Jews? But I also looked at the other side and, and we're trying to seek some sonic portrayals, some portrayals and sounds of, of music written about Jews 
Think about um, um, Salome by Richard Strauss from 1905. There is a very, very famous scene there of five Jews arguing about the meaning of God. Um, and to see those Jews arguing, to hear their text, to, to hear their register, uh, to hear the polyphony or the lack thereof of polyphony that, that um, Richard Strauss was uh, working on while setting the scene is to learn a lot about imagery and, and their migration from one thinker to another till the point where they material, materialize in, in the form of a scene. So music by Jews is as important as music uh, about Jews in a, a certain habitat, but this would be, all, all of that would be meaningful if we don't understand the cultural discourse of modernity at a certain location. So when I started my work there, I knew I, I, I don't want to look just for the Jews because that would be a, a grave methodological mistake. Uh, um, we, we found out throughout the years, especially during the 30s and 40s, that uh, during those decades, there was uh, one thing common to philo-Semites and anti-Semites. And that's kind of might be a little bit of a shock to some of you that both philo-Semites and anti-Semites were looking for difference, for a completely different set of reasons. The philo-Semites wanted to, to prove that Jews are different because of their history and background, and there is something essentially different about the way they write music. Well, the anti-Semites were arguing that basically the same thing, only that, in the, only that they did it in the form of a danger, and that, therefore this is something that should be distant from distance from society because it was a, a threat uh, that might contaminate uh, the the purity of a certain ethnic origin or national uh, community. So pursuing just the Jews is always the wrong thing to do uh, if you want to study culture uh, in a, as a network. So I focused on several composers and their habitats. And one of them was uh, um, an Italian Jewish composer uh, who lived in Florence until 1939, uh, which was the time he, he emigrated to the States. Uh, he was driven to the States uh, more accurately uh, following the Berlin Axis, uh, the Berlin-Rome Axis uh, that uh, implemented racial laws in Italy. But uh, this composer uh, has one of the very Long, one, uh, probably the longest name of the composer you will ever hear, Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco. Uh, Mario Castelnuovo Tedesco, uh, his, his collection is actually not, unfortunately, uh, is not housed at the National Library in Jerusalem, but rather at the Library of Congress because he ended his life in Beverly Hills, uh, uh, California. Um, so I had to go to the Library of Congress to go over his archive and Ernest Bloch's uh, a Swiss Jewish composer who left for the States in 1916, and Darius Nio, a French Jewish composer who left for the States in 1940. Um, and I worked on the, uh, and uh, I started studying these uh, archival uh, collections, specifically Mario Castellano Tedesco. And I discovered this very thick autobiography, old typescript, typescript uh, 750 odd pages. Um, and there were several chapters dedicated to his Jewish compositions. Uh, one of them I was looking for because I couldn't find anywhere. It was unpublished. It was uh, Le Odi, the famous acrostic 16th century uh, poem. Um, and I was looking for uh, the work um, about which I knew through articles and, and various other sources. Um, and in the autobiography, which was written in Italian, he told the story of of, uh, uh, of this work that he deposited the manuscript at Universal Edition, which was his publisher in Vienna. And one of the uh, warehouses was bombed and there was, a, uh, and there was a fire there and many manuscripts were just gone. We'll never know what was, what was there unless it was published and we have copies and so forth, or if the composers had copies, but Castanova de Desco didn't have any copy. But luckily someone found the manuscript. He knew Castanova de Desco and he sent it to him, he, sent, he, he, he snail mailed it to him uh, in the States. And when Castellano Tedesco got that, he realized that this was the piece that was just saved. So he copied that for himself and he would later write an arrangement for a mixed choir and an organ, and it would be performed in the States uh, 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 in several uh, reform temples. Um, but he sent 
and that's what he told me in the, in the autobiography, he decided to send the, the original manuscript, which, he, which was commissioned by a uh, Sephardic synagogue in, in uh, Amsterdam. He decided to send the, the original manuscript back to uh, Jerusalem, to the National Library, to deposit it there. So here I am in Washington, DC, realizing that I came all the way only to learn that the piece I was looking for, this was one of many items I was looking for, is actually back home. I was living at, back at the time in Tel Aviv, but you know, for, what are 40 miles uh, when you need to travel to find a manuscript? That's, that's meaningless. So uh, eventually I had to go to DC to realize that, that this manuscript is waiting for me in, uh, in some sort of a box with all kinds of, uh, it's in, it was, it was um, um, cataloged under miscellaneous um, and it was there. And I found the manuscript and I wanna show it to you right now. Um, this is the manuscript, Lechala. This is the first page. It was written in 1936. As you can see, Castellano Tedesco had a beautiful handwriting, so you can actually read it from the score. Um, it was written for uh, for um, um, it was written for for a male choir and a chazan and a leader. Um, and, and later in the States, he changed the 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 setting, the instrumentation to um, uh, to just. Uh, mixed choir, uh, the chazan, of course, and an organ. But that was for the American setting. And if you go to the Milken Archive website, you can hear the recording of the American version of this work. This arrangement hasn't been performed yet, believe it or not. Um, so this was one of the items I was trying to, uh, to uh, look for when I was writing my PhD. And as I told you, I had to go to DC to realize that the stuff was actually uh, in Jerusalem. Um, but I want to talk about the the habitat or the habitats that that emerged in 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 British Palestine and later the state of Israel. And to do so, I want you to see. I want you to look at uh, this half tone that I prepared, um, just so we can somehow um, visualize the simultaneities that uh, are taking place in the 20th century. Because as I told you, when you write history through the archive, you have to factor in all kinds of uh, developments that unfold at the same time. So while I was working on this, um, um, let's say historical segment, Europe between 1910s and 1930s, I had several composers under consideration. One is Mario Castellano Tedesco, about whom I just told you. Uh, the other is Arnold Schoenberg. They are very different in style. Um, and their aesthetic is very different, but um, they still uh, thought about uh, Jewish culture. They were part of, of, uh, of this uh, uh, brand of art music that um, drew on Jewish topics, be they musical or aesthetic or literary or visual, it doesn't matter. We had also Ernst Bloch. Um, and the other names here in this uh, weird amoeba uh, are composers who at the time were le relatively unknown, maybe except Stefan Volpe uh, and Erich Walter Sternberg, whose career started off in a quite in, in, a, in a very promising way. Uh, but as soon as, in, but as, soon as uh, Nazism rose to power, of course, everyone had to leave. They couldn't um, they couldn't stay neither in Germany nor in Europe. So. Um, all those five names here below, Joseph Tal, Paul Ben Chaim, Alexander Boscovich, Erich Walter Sternberg, Stefan Volpe, eventually left for Palestine. They all arrived in the, in the 30s as part of the uh, fifth wave of Aliyah, of, uh, a wave of immigration um, that arrived in Israel uh, between roughly 39, 32 and 39. This was the first time in history when Jews from Central and Western Europe arrived in significantly large numbers. And they basically institutionalized uh, um, uh, musical life in Palestine. And this went hand in hand with the establishment of the Israel-Palestine Orchestra, later to be renamed the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, the Palestine Broadcast Service, later um, the Voice of Israel, and, and uh, the, the uh, Khan Cooperative, that is uh, the public uh, uh, radio we ha currently have. Um, and of course, we had some conservatories and music academies that 
uh, that could um, recruit those people as part of their faculty to teach music, to teach theory, to teach performance, and we had audiences, and we even had some musicologists who help uh, who helped uh, build this field of writing about music uh, in various registers, be it journalistic, academic, um, um, and so forth. So once you work on, on, on Europe in the 1910s and 1930s, you realize that you are looking at something that is part and parcel of, of modern music in Europe on the one hand, yet something that is about to transition and, and brutally uh, undergo dislocation, partly to the US and partly to the, to, Levant, to the Levant or specifically to British Palestine. Now, when you move to the next phase, uh, which is marked here as British Palestine 1930s till I Israel 1960s, then you see that those composers, um, most of them stayed in, in Palestine later to be the state of Israel. Others joined them, Mordechai Setter, for example, and Svi Avni. Um, and, and, uh, and Stefan Volpe eventually in 1938 leaves for the States because his style is considered too avant-garde for, for uh, um, uh, a community that was by and large very conservative as far as music is concerned. So his zeal was shared on the socialist uh, level, but never uh, at the musical one. So when he realized that and when the other side and, and when his employer, uh, employee uh, uh, realized that uh, in uh, um, at the conservative Jerusalem Music Conservatory, uh, they decided to uh, go their separate ways. And we lost a wonderful composer who could have been uh, who could have uh, facilitated a wonderful avant-garde scene that never really took off properly here. Um, the reason I'm showing you both of those phases combined is not because we have names that uh, of composers who were partly uh, uh, working in Europe and then in Palestine, but also in order to say that um, the year 1948, as much as it's uh, important politically, meant very little in terms of uh, musical developments I, uh, and, uh, and the uh, schools of thought and, and compositional attitudes that developed in Palestine. To begin with, there was no school in Palestine. There was no uh, um, style of, of composers who arrived here. They all came from different schools. So to understand their music, you have to understand their habitat their, and, and the cultural discourse they came from, uh, which is why uh, this word that comes out too easily uh, when talking about music, uh, you know, people to say the Jewish identity of this composer, the Israeli identity of that composer, that's a little bit too easy because if Paul Ben Chaim arrives here uh, in his late 30s uh, and, and he is um, already a trained composer and an experienced one who has written uh, symphonies and, and, and art songs and uh, concerti and solo works, uh, think about the day after he arrives in, in Palestine. What does it say about his identity? And does he have to identify with everything that's going on here? Because keep in mind that uh, uh, one of the reasons they were thrown out or were forced to leave or driven to Palestine, pick whatever uh, formulation that works for you, was, was because of zealous uh, um, nationalistic approach that couldn't bear the thought of, of others. And now, they had to practice the same, the same mode of thinking, only doing it in a Jewish context. Not everyone agreed to that. Not everyone understood that. So it's very easy to come to the archive with those predispositions that we are going to look for Yemenite tunes that, that are somehow uh, harmoniously combined in a symphonic format, or a Persian um, uh, psalmody that is uh, set to, let's say, acquire in, of course, in, in Western harmony, and that all harmonizes very well, and, and it might even be a metaphor for kibbutz galiot, for the gathering of exiles. Um, this is a very common predisposition, but uh, when you dive into the archive, you realize that this is only uh, a segment, maybe 10, and if I'm generous, 15% of the, of the entire scene. And what I want to show you today is a little bit of, of uh, what you see when you dive into the archive, read documents and, and, and diaries and transcriptions and, uh, and uh, 
um, and other sources that together, in addition to, of course, other uh, um, primary and secondary sources, you can come up with a significantly different history than the one you came in, or hopefully the one you checked out at the door before you said good morning to Gila. Um, so let's look at this manuscript, for example. This is a piece written by Paul Ben Chaim, Paul Frankenburger, in 1943. It's a, it's a, it's the fifth movement of, of, uh, of a short cycle called Five Pieces for Piano from, from 1943. I want you to hear this piece performed, beautifully performed actually, uh, before we get uh, to the, the, the two kinds of stories that one can hear, can hear about and that one encounters uh, in the archive. So here's the work. Let me just share, share the screen again. Now with sound, okay. Um, no, 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 my bad. Sorry. Okay, it won't cooperate. I don't know why. I'll try a different way. Here it is. Okay, a couple of things. Um, to begin with, when you see such a, such a page, you realize that um, this is, um, can, you, can you see the uh, screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you see the screen now? Um, when you see such a page, you realize this is a work in progress. Uh, there are deletions here. Uh, there are several versions, some corrections, and he, if you look at the page itself, you can see that he used, he used two kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, pencils, so it's easy to see that he came back the next day and made some insertions, a repetition here, a deletion there, an addition, an addition uh, down below, and so forth. So uh, you, you can actually tra track the way uh, the composer thinks. Uh, how he thinks about the piece, how it should evolve, how it should unfold, how we, and the way it should uh, not unfold, and, and the ways he corrects himself uh, as he goes. So this is this is just one aspect of it, uh, perhaps more um, musicological if you want to get into semiotics and analysis and so forth. But what was interesting about this is that every book I read about this piece said that this is an imitation of the oud, of the uh, uh, Arab lauta, of the uh, this. Uh, uh, um, instrument that you pluck uh, and try to get, everyone talked about the imitation of Arab music, of Levantine music, um, of uh, uh, Orientalism of some sort. And, and that was my impression. And actually when you hear that, it's quite similar to, to these descriptions, but also, mind you, to all kinds of uh, modern Spanish music that was written uh, at the time, let's say by composers like Manuel de Falla, uh, because they use the same scalar, scalar systems uh, and the same textures, and they, they had the same mimetic uh, technique in mind when they imitated either the, the guitar or the lauta or all kinds of sounds that were Mediterranean. That's all fair and dandy. However, when you open the page, and you look at the at the title upstairs. It says toccata, and it's toccata because of the of the texture and the way it's written. Toccata in Italian means toccare in Italian means to touch, and it's usually when when a composer titled his pieces toccata. Ever since the late 17th century, he meant that this is a virtuoso piece for keyboard, nothing other than that. But in the in parentheses here, he said dance of the rain, as simple as that. 
so it's very nice to tell stories about the Levant and, and the exotic sounds and the imitation of Arab music and even about the uh, identity of the composer who has been living by then for 10 years in, uh, in British Palestine, not yet Israel. But somehow it doesn't work up, it doesn't work uh, uh, with the, uh, um, uh, with the with the manuscripts, and you know what? There are dozens of other manuscripts that show that, of all persons, this particular composer, who's who was a brilliant composer, don't get me wrong here, but he was crowned as a national composer, prematurely crowned crowned as a, as a composer. And the more I learned about him through the archive, the more I realized that if there is one topic that he was indifferent to, it was nationalism be it German or Jewish. How do I know that? Because this is not the only proof, of course, but uh, how do I know that? First of all, he served uh, uh, um, in the German army uh, in an anti-aircraft battery during the First World War. And I, I got to read a significant number of his letters, to, mainly to his sister. In it, he was mainly concerned with uh, uh, her uh, publishing his early works with different publishers. And he was always writing about his sense of culture as if as his sense of nationalism was a sense of civic participation as a cultured person, as a composer, not because of his sense of patriotism, not because of his uh, essential affi uh, affiliation to the idea of Germaness or the German spirit, but because he was, uh, he perceived that as civic uh, uh, nationalism in the form of culture. And there, there is more than one instance where he writes to her that the idea of war, that the, the idea that we have to fight, that with the idea that we fight in the name of the nation is absurd. And when he was in Israel, he couldn't identify with the same national project, with the same mechanism that eventually ended with his emigration to Palestine. And at one point, as you know, he didn't have anywhere to go back to because the world has changed after uh, 1945. But uh, whenever composers were holding um, discussions about the meaning of, of Israeli music, uh, what is Israeli music, what's Israeli about music and so forth, he never took part in those discussions. And his comments were always aphoristic. He always differentiated between good music and bad music. Other than that, he never wanted to touch the idea of nationalism. So this topic comes again and again and again in his writing and in his music. And it's true that he did find some common denominator when he set biblical text to music, but that's what he did in, in Europe anyway. He also set biblical text to music. So that can, can be held against him as, as, as something that attests to his Jewish slash Israeli identity because Christian composers were doing the same thing as well. Uh, when my students are trying to pin down the meaning of Jewish music, uh, I always tell them, imagine a, 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 a Japanese composer who came across uh, a transcription of a Yom Kippur piyut, and, he, and he's writing a violin concerto out of that. Would you consider it Jewish music? And then they're alarmed. Now I can make it worse. I can say Palestinian composer who took a Zionist uh, a patriotic songs from the 20s and made it made a cello concerto or a symphony out of it. And that would be even more alarming. But that sh that exactly shows you why these uh, um, these terms, the definitions of identity, are just too stiff to work with, and they fall apart when you work at the archive. Now let's go back to our sketch. Um, I want you to listen to another piece to think about uh, about this uh, elasticity that I am experiencing. Uh, or have been experiencing ever since I set foot in the uh, music department uh, at the National Library. So my next example is this piece, which you can see here, uh, digitized, so you can read it in, in a very convenient manner. We're also in Lechad Adi right now. We're looking at two items, basically. The first one is a transcription uh, from the early 20s of a Sephardic uh, the Sephardic version of Lechadodi, um, which was published in uh, Edelson's uh, Thesaurus, Volume 4. Uh, this is transcription number eight, um, used for Shabbat evening. Um, this is very much straightforward. It's very, very straightforward. Some, some communities here in Jerusalem still sing this version. 
Um, but the reason I'm showing it to you is that, and now let's go back to my sketch one more time, is that this composer, Mordechai Setter, who didn't arrive from Germany, he arrived with his family from Russia in 1926. Um, he, was, he was 10 by that time, um, uh, which meant that he had a completely uh, different intellectual biography compared with the composers who arrived in the 30s with no ability to talk Hebrew properly ever. Um, because he grew up uh, to be a native Israeli, even uh, went to school um, and experienced a Sephardic accent uh, and could read Hebrew far better than any of those immigrant composers listed here on the left. Um, and in 1940, when he was only uh, 24, after studying in Paris with Nadia Boulanger, which is a very important part of his history because when you say Nadia Boulanger, you have to think about composers like uh, Carlos Chavez and our Aaron Copeland um, and, and Philip Glass and Virgil Thompson and, and many others who came and Villa Lobos, of course, who came to Paris uh, to, to the Boulangerie of Mrs. Boulanger. And, uh, and the one act she did maybe two acts, very rigorous uh, 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 curriculum that was focused on, on early, um, uh, early music, roughly from the 14th to 16th century, uh, thick polyphony with, with rigorous uh, restrictions, and then hopping elegantly above German music with a touch of Brahms towards modern music with, with a heavy focus on Stravinsky. Um, Setter studied with her for nearly two, nearly three years. Uh, eventually he left and came back to Palestine. So he was a very different creature than those who came from Central and Western Europe. Um, and in 1940, when he was 24, after getting his uh, education in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, and by the way, one of the reasons he couldn't continue his, uh, could have further his studies here is that there weren't enough institutions and even the composer who arrived in Palestine, like this guy here, Erich Walter Sternberg, he couldn't communicate with, with this native Hebrew-speaking boy. And Erich St Walter Sternberg, who died in 1974, could never formulate a decent sentence in Hebrew. So this was a pretty much a problem of communication. So he had to go to Paris. Now, in 1940, he is invited by another composer, whose name is not listed here, um, Yoachim. Joachim Stuchevsky uh, um, to write a piece for the concert series they were holding back then in uh, Beit Brenner in Tel Aviv, at Beit Brenner in Tel Aviv. Um, and Stuchevsky did more than that. He actually gave Mordechai Setter a thesaurus, uh, um, the, the first five volume of Idleson Thesaurus with hundreds of transcriptions of various liturgical uh, events from uh, Shabbat Eve to uh, the High Holidays to um, uh, uh, biblical tropes and of Torah tropes and all kinds of liturgical poems for various uh, um, occasions. And Mordechai Seder decided to work with, uh, with volume four with the music of Sephardic Jews. And he ended up writing a piece called Cantata for Shabbat. It's all in Hebrew. It's for a mixed choir and, and a very uh, uh, modest uh, accompaniment, uh, orchestral accompaniment. And I want us to focus on, on the third movement, which is called Lechado Di, in which he took this transcription by Edelson, ta -di -da 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 -di da 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 and so forth. But the reason I told you about his Paris adventure is that I, want you, I wanted you to, to uh, uh, factor in that he um, when he was working on, let's say, 15th or 16th century music uh, as a composition student, he was doing, uh, he was doing those uh, harmonization exercises where he, where he would take a melody, he would place that in the middle, and then he would harmonize everything around it. So what he was implementing here, basically, was to treat this transcription as if this was Gregorian chant. But he wasn't interested in Orientalism per se, so he, he didn't he didn't have any need to display Palestine's peripheral masks in order to justify himself being a Westerner or, or a Western composer. 
what he did was to deconstruct this music in a very brutal but, but uh, subtle manner. And what he did was he used the notes that are written here, but he changed their duration. In fact, he augmented them to the point of, um, of deconstructing the melody. Now think about the simplest melody you can think of, Yankee Doodle, right? And try to sing every note eight times longer than its original duration. Now you might try to do that eventually, but what's going to happen is that you're going to lose the nature of the melody and you're going to stay only with the intervallic properties, only with the intervals. That's the only thing that's going to remain identifiable, but the music is going to be completely different. Now, if you drown that in a, in a polyphonic vocal uh, setting where you have additional vocal entries at each line, then the music is further blurred and, and, and undergoes and it undergoes abstraction to the point of becoming or being absorbed into the background. And that's exactly what this composer was looking because that's exact, that's the kind of modernism he saw both in early European music and in modern Parisian music. So there was no reason for him uh, to, um, to act as if, uh, to act in, in a manner that, that his colleagues uh, were uh, practicing, which is uh, uh, displaying in a very orientalistic manner their peripheral masks, uh, accentuating or overemphasizing the idea of, of exoticism in music. And the irony is that the music is there, the, the same notes are there, the duration has changed, uh, the, the growing, the thickening vocal texture uh, of course, eclipses the melody, but you cannot identify it ever as uh, in the way that I sang earlier, because I sang the original rhythm and the original um, uh, duration of each note. But it's a very it's a it's a very different manner here, and the and this mode of abstraction became an ideal already in 1940. You'd think that the the high voltage of ideology would negate such an abstracted option, but the opposite is true because we see it in the compositional practice praxis. And you know what? He wasn't the only one. I just don't have enough time. So I'm just giving you one sample. Maybe we'll get to a second one, not by setter. So the whole idea that we that only national music was written here and, and only this kind of Eurocentric uh, exoticism was practiced here is, is a common myth. It's a convenient myth, but the archive says different. Let's listen to this piece. Um, it should be 7.55 here. I'm just again, no, 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 no. Yeah. Why are you Okay, you can actually go to the uh, uh, National Library's website and, and listen to this uh, entire cantata um, and to this particular recording. Um, uh, we are moving on, but still with Setter. The amazing thing here is that an, a new piece was born and it, it, it went hand in hand with his ideal of not subjugating uh, himself, not subjugating the composer to, this, to the transcription, but rather freeing the material 
the music material from its materiality. Now, I'm stealing, I'm, I'm uh, plagiarizing this uh, uh, phrasing, uh, freeing, the, the freeing the material of its materiality. Where did I find that? Of course, in the archive, Setter left uh, a diary uh, of 36 notebooks that uh, uh, with a total of uh, 2,700 pages um, filled with his ideas, uh, sometimes scheduled, um, sometimes teaching schedule, sometimes teaching curriculum, sometimes his uh, um, ideas regarding certain compositions or Judaism or redemption or Kabbalah um, or self-analysis of his work. It's, it's, an endless, uh, it's an endless work. I wish I could publish this, but it's unreadable because these are, it's basically a collection of many, many fragments Including including hundreds of citations of books he he was reading uh, in between fifty two and nineteen and early nineteen ninety four he died in nineteen ninety four um, and you can track their various crises that he was uh, going through and impact and and creative impasses that he had to resolve throughout his life uh, the last one uh, was left unresolved he he couldn't compose after nineteen eighty seven. Uh, but here I had to, again, factor in his biography. He was born in Russia, came here at the age of 10, uh, left for Paris at the age of 16, and came, and came back uh, here at the age of 21. So he had, you'd think, native Russian. It was good Russian, but he couldn't practice it. I mean, I, I doubt whether he could read Tolstoy in Russian. Uh, he had good Hebrew, but he could never write uh, articles or text about music, unlike some of his peers who were very prolific in writing about music, even though they were also immigrants. I'm not talking about the natives. Of course, it was easy for them, easier for them to write in Hebrew. Um, and um, um, and his French was okay. I mean, he could read books, but he couldn't write in French either. So in many ways, he was in a linguistic limbo. He didn't have, his Russian wasn't fully developed. He couldn't write uh, texts in Hebrew. He could read poetry in Hebrew, but up to a certain uh, um, up to a certain period, he could read the the romantic, the romantic and late romantic modern Hebrew literature. But when it came to modern Hebrew literature of the fifties and sixties, that was not his cup of tea, to say the least. Um, so he was caught in a limbo where he couldn't really write uh, uh, long articles. And and the truth is that he has only one. Uh, article published in Haaretz, very short one, uh, practically insignificant, another article on music aesthetics and the way he sees that, but it's a two-page article which uh, he had a lot of trouble finalizing, a lot of trouble uh, finalizing as I learned from the archive. And at one point after reading, eventually I had to read the entire diary, the entire 2700 pages, but at one point I got to this lovely and, pain, and, and painful uh, uh, page in his diary where he writes about the problem of language or he, the way he treats uh, the Hebrew language. And he writes as follows, and I will translate that for you. All the music, I, all the text I, I had set to music, the cantata, which you've heard, the motets, midnight vigil and so forth. This was written in the early 1960s. All of these texts are national, traditional and not rather than personal lyrical. Because Hebrew for me is a sacred tongue, he writes. Uh, a language that cannot be used to express the most intimate and daily thing like any other language. The reason for that, he writes, is that Hebrew is, and I, I'm going to say that in Hebrew because it's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an important assonance. These are, it sound, it's, it, it sonically rhymes, the sound are, uh, would rhyme here, but the meaning is, is, is crucial and it's crucially different. And he writes, the reason for that is Hebrew is sfat imi and not sfat, uh, sfat ami, sorry, and not sfat imi. Now that sounds, sounds pretty much the same, sfat ami and sfat imi. But what it says is that Hebrew is the language of my people, but not my mother tongue. And, um, and from that, I learned a lot uh, looking at, uh, at other, uh, at other uh, compositions of his and, and following his, his uh, uh, 
compositional dialectics. I knew that he was caught in limbo where he uh, wasn't able to write about music in uh, neither in Hebrew nor in Russian nor in English, which he which which he which he had, but it was decent and not more than that. Nor in French, and I knew that this uh, this linguistic limbo um, limited him from at one point from interacting with contemporary Hebrew uh, culture, which he uh, uh, couldn't identify with at one point, let's say in the mid 60s. Um, and he reverted to Kabbalistic ideas, um, uh, which he read about uh, in Gershom Sholem's um, um, books. And by the way, as soon as I discovered how heavily he drew on Sholem in his uh, diary, in his diaries, I could go to the Sholem collection at the same library and 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 look at the ideas that were getting published at the same time and trying to understand what exactly was he reading, because sometimes he would give you the reference and that's easy, but sometimes he wouldn't. And then I realized that uh, the these redemptive models that he studied uh, uh, about. In, uh, in, in studies in Kabbalah were shaping his trajectories, compositional trajectories in the larger pieces. But at one point, he stopped importing non-Western Jewish musical traditions to his music. He stopped using text in his music and he reverted to what he calls here Lashon Lilim, the language of, of, of sounds, of tones, because at one point, he couldn't believe in this uh, Zionist project because he felt it was collapsing right in front of his eyes. This was before the Six Day War. Again, one of the great weaknesses of cultural histories is that they um, all too easily uh, allow political and, and, uh, um, and uh, military um, historical dates to punctuate their own uh, uh, history. And that's not... That's not how it works. So, um, at least not in in in, uh, in culture. So it's very easy to say before sixty seven and after sixty seven, before forty eight, after forty eight. Culture unfolds in a completely different dialectical rhythms, and those events, as big as important as they are, are mere catalysts to something that preexisted this uh, event. So this is where you become intimate with the composer, and you realize why, why at one point he distanced himself. He distanced himself from text, from biblical text, from text from the Talmud, even from uh, um, uh, liturgical music, which he already in his early 20s uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, which he already in the early tw uh, 20s uh, worked in a manner that won't be subject uh, subjected to the subjugated, sorry, to the to the uh, uh, transcription. I'm taking you back to this uh, sketch. There is one person here who happened to take part in all three in all three phases: Europe 1910s, 1930s, Palestine 30s to 60s, Israel 60s to 70s. And that's Josef Tal. Um, Josef Tal was born in 1910 um, and got his musical education in Paris at the um, um, Academy uh, um, uh, der Kunst in Berlin. And he studied uh, at a period where post tonal music was uh, uh, developing, 12 tone music, even electronic music was in its uh, uh, early days. And when he arrived in Palestine in, in April of 1934, um, it was very difficult for him to identify with all kinds of folkish formulations that uh, passed through as Zionist. This is not to say that he didn't set uh, national music to uh, national text to music. Uh, he was one of the first composers, modern composers, to set um, to set uh, poems by Rachel uh, to uh, to music already in the 30s, uh, in the late 30s, with a very broken Hebrew. Uh, and uh, um, and he uh, wrote a cantata based on uh, Hannah and her sons. 
um, from the Book of Maccabees. Um, and he also wrote an opera on, about uh, Saul, King Saul at Endor with the famous story in, in the ghost with the ghost wife uh, uh, using the original biblical text from uh, Samuel 1st chapter 28. Um, and he was also one of the first composers, and this is also something I found in the archive, who in not, as, early in 19, as early as 1952 wrote about the problems of music in Israel. Now think about the, the, uh, uh, the ideological zeal of, of the early days, as much as it was rough absorbing, all, uh, absorbing new immigrants from uh, North Africa and the Near East, here is a composer writing about problems of music in Israel. Not only that, look at this paragraph here. He says, uh, many people are actively working in the field of national creation, but only a minority of them are favored with that measure of inspiration, which would raise the great idea of peoplehood from the realm of feeling to the realm of, of, of expression. This lack of inspiration has done much harm because it establishes conventional forms as national music and opposes anything which deviates from those forms with all the weapons of chauvinist polemics. So he talks about short-sighted provincialism is spreading even among us, and we have to be on guard against confusing it with a positive national creation. Now, this is something that uh, became, let's say, conventional wisdom only in the 80s. But he, in the 30s, was able to say, we cannot make this uh, uh, notion of, of national music, of popular, euphonic, listener-friendly music, uh, uh, an oppressive paradigm for everyone here. And while he was writing that, he was working on a sketch. Uh, he was working on his um, second piano concerto from 1953, where he was using, or at least he told uh, um, in his program, in a concert program, that he was using a Persian music in his uh, second piano concerto, which in its most exposed, exposed version appears at the beginning of the second uh, movement of this piano concerto. That's all very nice. But when you get into the details, you realize that there is a melody that is Persian and, and uh, uh, was originally used for a certain uh, psalm chapter in the Persian uh, uh, version of uh, uh, found in Edelson Thesaurus. But in fact, it was a Lithuanian. Uh, it, it was a Lithuanian dirge um, 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 that he found in another book, in another Edelson's book. But he was too afraid to say back then in the '50s that it was Ashkenazi because anything that came from Eastern Europe was at least rhetorically banned. So this taboo on whatever was considered exilic. Uh, um, uh, created this. Uh, this spin in public relations where people up until, I think up until a month and a half, because this is in my, in my uh, new book, no one knew that, that this was originally a Lithuanian tune because they all followed what the composer had said. It was, it was an, a Persian and Persian was better than Lithuanian because with Persian, you could practice and, and abide by the rhetoric that this is we are returning to our sources, not only to the land and returning, returning the land and returning to the land, we're also returning to our um, biblical ancestor. And what, what better return could we demonstrate than to go back to those communities who were isolated from the West? But the music is a, is a post-tonal, very modern uh, uh, for its time uh, setting that sounds that the, the melodic contour uh, could be found in, in, in Edelson's Persian transcriptions. But eventually the source was Lithuanian. It was found in another, in the most basic book. This was found in, this is Lamentation 1, the opening of the book of Lamentation, uh, it said here Ashkenazic, but it's Lithuanian originally. And this, this was published in one of the basic books on Jewish music by Edelson himself, originally published in 1929. But then it was a taboo, so he uh, replaced that. And this was a fair misconception because, and I'm going back to the idea of misconceptions. This is a book um, 
that you normally wouldn't find in, in, in an archival collection of a composer because it's a printed book and it might be part of, the, of what the library holds or not. But uh, in this book in 1949, this musicologist who was also one of the individuals who came in the 30s as part of the Aliyah that I was talking about earlier, when he wrote about uh, uh, Yosef Tal, this was 1949, Yosef Tal had been living by, the, by, uh, by then for 15 years in Palestine and had written at least well, roughly 20 works or so. This is what he wrote, wrote about him. The compositions of jo Josef Gruenthal, that was his original uh, name before he changed it to Tal in 1949, born 1910, and Heinrich Jacobi, uh, we won't talk about him uh, today, are works of absolute music that show little uh, influence of Palestine or general oriental character. Hmm. Absolute music means that this is music about music, music that uh, generates meaning from its, its inner semiotics only. And now he speculates, Gradenwitz, the musicologist. This may be due to the fact that the, that the composers are residents of Jerusalem and have less contact with rural life and atmosphere than their colleagues in the coastal towns or country villages. Interesting, because Mordechai Setter uh, uh, was living in Tel Aviv and that didn't bother him to uh, have his uh, uh, music undergo severe abstractions um, um, and so forth. Now, this is something I wouldn't find in, in, uh, in, uh, in an archival collection, as I said. So at one point, I went to the family and I said, do, do you have Josef Tal's copy? I wanted to see if he commented on that because I said, there is no way Josef Tal, who was a zealous modernist, uh, would read that and would just sit quietly and, and look at the page and say, okay, he made a mistake. Because if you, if you were to read the earlier paragraphs, you would see that uh, Gradenwitz had been in touch with, uh, um, with Josef Tal, and he knew about every composition he was writing, including one that was uh, still unfinished at the time. It was called uh, The Mother Rejoices. It was a cantata uh, for a boys choir, uh, mezzo-soprano, and orchestra, and a piano. Um, and he knew about this piece as well. So he knew about what he was writing, but he still had this image that this, this person writes absolute music that has nothing to do with Palestine or Orientalism, even though Josef Tal set uh, poems to uh, uh, poems of Rachel, to uh, poems by Rachel to music, even though he wrote uh, um, music on the books of Maccabees, even though he would, uh, he would write uh, music uh, for choir based on Yemenite um, and based on Yemenite tunes but in a modernist setting, that wasn't enough. He labeled him as a modern composer. And, it, and, and for decades, people would say, Josef Tal is an avant-garde, and, and that was a code for, he's not a national, national composer. And that, of course, twisted the entire discourse. But in order to fully convince you, you'll have to read more than, or hear more than just this lecture. But I want to show you Josef Tal's own copy uh, of this page, page 247. When Josef Tal was reading this text, he was writing on the side, ha ha ha. Uh, and this was a rare moment for me, you know, uh, because I realized that this path that I was uh, led into following all those scraps of information I had to piece together and build this network this was just one green light saying, keep going, because uh, you can't work with those labels. As I said, you have to check them at the door, and suddenly you see the composer smiling back at you and saying, that was funny. That was a funny paragraph, actually, because nothing in, in it is true. Nothing really looked at the music, and, and it was too committed to nationalism without even listening to what's going on in the works themselves. And I'll end with this. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, Pam asked, who wrote the Toccata Dance uh, of the Rain, please? The first uh, piece you, sh you showed us. Uh, this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. who, who was the composer? Oh, this is Paul Ben Chaim. This is Paul Ben Chaim, mm -hmm. um, was written in 1943. Uh, um, fifth movement. 
from a piece called Five Pieces for Piano. Thank you very much. An anonymous question about the same piece. Were, were there any Sephardi influences on this? No. I mean, I, I understand the, uh, the association. Uh, the thing is that when you use a certain, um, uh, when you, a certain scale or a set of intervals, it creates this, uh, this it, it, it associates with Spanish music, but you can actually hear it in, um, in music by French composers in the early 20th century, but also in, uh, by uh, composers like Domenico Scarlatti or, uh, uh, or Soler, Antonio Soler in the early 18th century. So um, if he were, uh, if Ben Chaim were familiar with, uh, with music by, um, let's say Ravel or Granados or Albanese, he might as well have been familiar with Scarlatti because as a, as a trained pianist, he must have played several sonatas by him. Uh, so this was a, a lingua franca, basically, but it doesn't have any direct connection with the uh, with with Spain or with Spanish culture. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding uh, one of the last composers you talked about, there's another anonymous question um, that says, "I had assumed that by the 70s Hebrew was no longer regarded as a holy tongue by non-ultra religious people." This page reflects the idea of Hebrew as a holy tongue. Could Dr. Shelleg explain this, please? Thank you. Uh, it was a holy tongue for, for Setter uh, because it was never his native tongue. That's why his relation to it, I mean, that, that's what I said. He couldn't read modern Hebrew literature that uh, defied God or, or deflated biblical images because he, uh, his limited access to, to Hebrew um, um, was the source of, of his perception of the, of the language in just one uh, very uh, immobile linguistic register. He couldn't consider, uh, and in fact, he never set to music anything contemporary because what they had that what they had done with Hebrew. If you think about uh, Yuda um, Yuda Michai, for example, the way he uh, knowingly deflated biblical imagery because he knew that they were. Uh, uh, valued in Zionist discourse, this was something that was un inconceivable uh, to uh, to Setter. So it was sacred language for a person who was in this linguistic limbo between Hebrew, Russian, and uh, and French. N neither one, uh, uh, other one, either one of which was fully developed uh, for him to either write about it or set it to music, which is why the only texts he could set to music were either biblical texts or or. Uh, uh, certain passages from the Talmud, which he found in in the, in Bialik's book of book of the legend, so he was very much um, uh, ensnared or caught or trapped in a, in an early linguistic register that uh, um, limited his entire entire interaction with Hebrew. Thank you very much. Uh, Jens uh, wrote, uh, I didn't understand why it was a taboo to say that it was a Lithuanian tune used in the piano concerto by Tom. Well, it was bigger than that. Um, um, the, a book that was written in 1951 by a musicologist and author, Max Brod, more familiar to you the, uh, as the person who uh, um, uh, preserved uh, Kafka's uh, writings, manuscripts against his own uh, wish, um, Max Brod wrote in 1951 that uh, um, music that represent uh, that are, that is imported from the Galut from from ex the exile exile always appears in the singular in the Sanus grammar uh, is undesirable. Of course, he didn't invent it. Uh, the the whole idea of having a national territory um, was uh, um, was a concept that, uh, on the one hand, allowed the uh, I allowed the, the invention of Hebrew culture and its and its constructs on the one hand, but on the other hand, it had to it necessitated the the negation or at least the rhetorical negation of other territories because if we can live everywhere, why insist on why what's the justification of having a national territory and having a national project where you uh, you would have to migrate in order to uh, be part of which was. And uncanny if you think about it. So 
the idea of territorial nationalism, at least in, in the way developed in, uh, in Zionist culture, was that in order to um, um, re, um, in order to uh, um, reconstruct uh, uh, our biblical sovereignty, we have to go back to a national territory. And if we are to go back to a national territory, we have to uh, invent a story by which life on other lands always ended up in a disaster. So we cannot uh, approve of life in the diaspora. This, this was the rhetoric. We can argue with that. And I, I'm certainly arguing with this idea because you cannot narrow down 18th century of existence as uh, a, of Jewish communities among host societies across the world as just a transitional episodes towards uh, uh, sovereignty in, uh, in the uh, 20th century. But that was the narrative because uh, if they, if Zionism recognized the histories and cultures and languages of other territories, then, um, then um, it would threaten its own project. Now in this discourse, uh, whatever was considered as exilic was abnormal, was degenerated, was undesirable. So uh, it is not a coincidence that all composers uh, used, uh, when, when they used uh, liturgical musics from various liturgical materials uh, from Jewish musical traditions, they were uh, turning to North African and Near Eastern musical traditions rather than Eastern European ones. This is not to say that melodies didn't migrate and became Hebrew songs. They did, but they were cloaked with different texts. So they always had to somehow hide or camouflage or, um, um, or blur the connection to, to what was always marked as the other, the abnormal, the degenerated, um, and the negated. So to say 1952 that I used a Lithuanian folk song, a Lithuanian, sorry, liturgical music, uh, was to um, was to go against this discourse doubly, both with a post-tonal music uh, on the one hand, and with something that was considered in the cultural discourse undesirable. So this is why he said it was Persian. But by the 70s, uh, um, someone mentioned the 70s, by the 70s, using Ashkenazi material as, as a source of, uh, as a source of um, um, ethnic, um, um, controversy was a different story, but back in the 50s, it was still under the rhetoric of uh, the rhetoric of negating the diaspora. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Shelleg. There are many compliments in the chat. I will be sure to send them to you. Uh, you. There's also a request for uh, a specific link and another request for your email. Um, to someone would like to contact you with a, with a specific question, not regarding um, what what you've been speaking about. So is it okay if I put your email in the chat? Yeah, yeah, not a problem. And I can uh, put in the chat for everyone uh, if you want to. Uh, um, these are the links to my two books. Um, you can read the uh, table of contents, maybe get a couple of pages on uh, Google Books. Um, and, um, and thank you again for listening. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to open the microphone so that you can thank Dr. Asaf Shelig personally. And uh, we'll see you in our next event. Laila Tov from Jerusalem. Good night. כן, באוניברסיטה העברית. מוזיקולוגיה? אפשר לבוא? אפשר לבוא. גם אם מבוגרים מאוד? כן, כן. טוב, שנה הבאה. וואי, אתה נפלא. נהדר. תודה רבה ממונסי ניו יורק. תודה רבה, לילה טוב. לילה טוב. היי מנחם, הלו. היו לי כמה דברים לומר, אבל זה לא... נדבר בינינו בהחלט. Good to see you. זה לא לשעת הרצאה, זה יש יותר מה להגיד. אני מזמן לא נהניתי ככה. תודה. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. לילה טוב. לילה טוב. Thank you all once more. לילה טוב from Jerusalem. We'll see you in our next event.